So James chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Now this, what this is saying here is, you see where it says uh, the word wars. That word wars is not... Not ne- it does not necessarily mean like wars, nation against nation. Okay, wars. It, it really is fighting, or uh, any any type of uh, battling between okay. one another. So when it says, uh, "From where do these these battles and fightings come among you?" So it could happen in the church, and in fact, this is written to the brethren, right? And so he would be more talking about the, uh, the battling in and amongst ourselves. He says, so where does all this come from that, that we would be fighting with each other? Come they not hence from here, even of your lusts, that war in your members. Now that word lust, we've said this before. A lot of times when we think of lust, we always think it has a sexual overtone. But in, it really represents a kind of a drive okay so obviously in in a sexual situation lust means a a sexual drive but you can have a lust for food you can have a lust for television you can right says here's well the wars come because you have these lusts or these drives that war in your physical uh, members your your physical body then verse 2 says ye lust and have not. In other words, uh, you you lust for it. You have a strong desire for something, but you do not have it. You kill and desire to have, and you cannot obtain. So you you're lusting, but you don't have it, and it's so powerful that you you desire it so much that you are willing to kill. How many have seen where uh, people have gotten into a little fight, some type of anger situation between two individuals, it could be family members, and they won't speak to each other for the rest of their lives? Essentially, maybe didn't cut someone's throat, but you, you killed the relationship, didn't you? And uh, whenever that happens, you just try to heal it if, if possible. So that's what it's saying here. So you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, you cannot obtain. Well, why can't you obtain? If you fight and you have battles or war, yet you have not because you ask not. Oh, look at that. You don't have something. You you desire this, but no matter what you do, you're willing to kill for it. You desire it, but you, you, you can't obtain it in your own strength. And why not? It says the reason you don't have it is because you, you didn't ask for it in the first place. Well, how do we ask for stuff from God? We pray. We ask God for, you know, the answer to his promises that he, he has promised us in his word. And so if we don't ask, it's uh, no surprise if we don't get it. And when you ask and you don't receive or you receive not uh, because you ask amiss. In other words, you've missed a good reason why you should have it. You're, you're asking uh, for something that maybe God doesn't want you to have. He says here, Sometimes you ask and you you receive it not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts or your own lusts. Again, lust, not necessarily sexual, but a drive that you have, a a strong desire. And he's saying that when you're asking for things, you may not receive it because you're asking for the wrong reason. If you were asking for something to help somebody... That's a whole lot, like you're asking, like if you're asking for money to help somebody or to, 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 uh, to feed, the, feed the poor or, the, or you know, give to the orphanage, or, that's a whole lot different than asking for something for you, right. right? And that's really what he's saying here, that you may consume it upon yourself, upon your own flesh. Verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses... 
Now this word, we brought this out before. Obviously, we all know what adultery is, right? In fact, that's one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, right? And adulterer is, would be a male. So an adulterer is a, a man that had an uh, adulterous relationship with, the, with a woman. If he's married, or they could have both been married or not, uh, one of them could have been married. So one of them has to be married for it to be adultery. This is adulterous and an adulteress. Of course, that's a female Right, female adulteress, and uh, so we usually think of that in terms of uh, a sexual act, right, and a physical act. But there's also a spiritual adultery, and that's what he's going to get into here. That you're supposed to. How many know that if you're part of Christ, Christ is your head. Christ is, according to the Apostle Paul, Christ is your husband. And you are the, he's coming for a virgin bride. So all of us in the church, we represent, we're, make, we're made up of the bride of Christ. James is saying that you can commit an adultery spiritually. Because if you belong to Christ, then you should be, uh, that saying, uh, don't just talk to talk but walk the walk, right? If you're in Christ, you're responsible to do what he says. We talked about that uh, song, I am the friend of God. How many have heard that? I am a friend of God. And we brought out in the scripture that, well, to be a friend of God, one of the conditions Jesus came around, Jesus' own mouth, he said, if you're going to be my friend, you've got to obey. So there's a lot of people going around saying, I am a friend of God. But they're not obeying, so are they a friend of God? Not according to the scripture. Anyway, so he's calling them, it's possibly an adulterer or adulteress in a spiritual sense. And then he goes further to explain it. You adulterers and adulteresses, verse 4, James 4, 4. uh, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That word en- enmity is also, uh, uh, you, could, you could substitute the word hatred. He's saying that you, if your friendship, of, if you're tied to this world, if your, your drives are towards this, this world and worldly possessions and a worldly life, then you're not focusing on the spiritual life, the, the newborn, born-again experience that you have in Christ. And if you're friends with the world, then you actually hate God because God's law is holy. I think the best way that we could probably understand this is there, we have a real big problem in the church. And all of us do it. When God tells us to do something, we should do it, right? But we don't always listen. We, it's kind of like a smorgasbord. We go up there and we pick, pick and choose what we want. You know, if you don't, don't like Chinese food, you're not going to get Chinese food, right? You just pick whatever you want. We don't really have any right as a child of God just to pick and choose what we want, in fact, the Bible calls that going and listening to teachers that will tickle, tickle your ear and tell you what you want to hear instead of what's in the book. And we need this book because it's the only way we really know the mind of God. So he says that to be a friendship or to, to, to be drawn close to this world is, is enmity with God or, or actually you, you're almost hating God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So what should we do about that? We should think the next time that we're sinning, we want to take it very serious that when, when we're sinning against God, we need to uh, repent. We need to turn that around because we're becoming the enemy of God. Who's, who's the number one enemy of God? Satan, Satan right? Do you want to have company with him? No. Me either. 
So verse 5, uh, do you think that the scripture saith in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? What that's actually saying is, the first, the first part is saying, uh, do you think the scripture says something in vain? In other words, God sent his word and said something, but it has no value or no meaning. It's no good for us to obey it. No, that, that's not true, right? Scripture is always good for us. Scripture is never in vain. So do you think that Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? The, the um, reading there is hard to understand what it's, what it's literally saying. We talked about the word lust being a, a, like a drive, a, a force within you. God himself has this strong drive to Envy, or another substitute word would be jealousy, right? Envy or jealousy. Now, so God reveals himself all the way through the Old Testament. He said, God is a jealous God, right? He said, don't bow down and serve these idols and don't go after false gods because I am a jealous God, right? So we learn all that uh, throughout the whole Old Testament. And, that, and he's really uh, bringing that up here. He said that so the, the, that God himself, the, he, he is driven and jealous for the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. God put that Spirit, when you become a Christian, God puts His Spirit in you, right? You become born again. And what God expects, or what, what God passionately desires, is that, that you allow that spirit to begin to conform your life, to transform your life, to transform your mind. But it's not going to do it automatically, because you have something to say about it. That's why we can still sin. That's why some of us uh, uh, can even turn away. Because just because we have the scripture, the, the spirit of God does not mean we're going to allow God to be in control. And by the way, God is a uh, father, right? Father figure. And so he has a responsibility when his children refuse to obey. I don't know if you, what kind of parents you had, but parents' responsibility when they're raising their children is to show them the way to go. Right? The right way to go, to discipline them. Well, I personally, I've had discipline from the Lord, and I don't want any extra. You know, I had my, my father and my mother, they disciplined me. And, you know, I didn't, at the time, I didn't think I really deserved it. You know, no, no one likes discipline. But when it comes to our Heavenly Father, we want to try to avoid being disciplined. By him, and how do we avoid that? By doing again, being obedient, by doing what he wants, and what he wants is for that that spirit within us to be given free reign to do its work, to transform us, to uh, to lead us to the word, to lead us to church, to lead us in in things that are not so much worldly but more spiritual, and having a relationship with him and with with others in the church. What can we do to help the, our situation? Because, like I said, we're in the church. We have the spirit. If you know, if we're, in, we're born again, we have the spirit of God. We're in the church, but many of us are falling short on this. Well, verse six begins that new thought here. He says, "He giveth, but He giveth more grace." How many know you're saved by grace, not of works? Right. That's a, that's a very important concept. There's nothing good that you did that got you to, to salvation because Christ redeemed you by the, his blood and by his sacrifice on the cross, right? It's the grace of God that he would even accept us. But here it says that when, when we realize, when we acknowledge this situation and how vulnerable we are to the temptations of, of, of the uh, physical uh, drive towards the world, he says he will give us more grace. He giveth more grace. Wherefore, he said, God resisteth the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. So the proper attitude is 
not to be proud, to, to turn against that pride when we have pride, and to humble ourselves and, and acknowledge, God, I made some mistakes here. Correct. Did you know, and we, we actually, I'm not going to go there now, but um, we, did la- we covered it last week. Um, did you know that uh, when you come to God and you ask him for forgiveness, he says he's faithful enough to forgive you for your sins. Faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that's what he's saying. But you, you need to, he gives you the grace. He'll give you the grace if you ask. Uh, but God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So submit yourself, therefore, to God. That word, by the way, submit yourself, it's a military term. If you think of a military, when uh, the commander gives the, um, the command and everybody falls in place to do what their specific duty is to do I mean you know if you go if you go to war not everybody does the same job right not everybody gets to drive the tank not everybody is a helicopter pilot right some people are medics well what were you called to do when it says submit yourself to God, it's really going back to God put you in the body and he gave you gifts and abilities and responsibilities. So what, what are they? And that's what he's saying, submit to God. He says submit yourself to God, do what, you're, what he's made you to do, do what he's empowered you to do, and then <clears throat> resist the devil. A lot of times we don't want to resist the devil. Some people don't believe the devil's real. I mean, there's people out there say they're Christian. They don't, he don't, they don't believe that there's a literal devil. Now, I can't say that I had dinner with them or anything, but I believe, according to the word, there is a literal devil. In fact, if you, I, I don't know where these people come from, but how, how many remember when Jesus was in the temptation? His 40 days and 40 nights in temptation, in the wilderness. And who came up to him? The devil. Either that or he was, you know, he's schizophrenic. He's talking to himself. No, there was a being there. A supernatural being. So there is a devil. But you may not see him with your eyes. You may not hear him. You know, he's sneaking up on you, but you don't hear him. But he's there. Yeah. And you're not safe when you go to church because the devil likes to go to church. That's where he he gets people. He tries to turn everybody against everybody else. You know what he loves to do? What he loves to do is to get you to talk about other people in the church. To gossip and to talk about it and spread it. And you know, we're so clever when it comes to gossip. We have a way of, we know in our hearts that we're not supposed to talk about people, right? So what we do, though, is we say, you know, I'm only telling you this because I want you to pray for this person. But <laughs> you, you ever hear that? That's common, right? And then we think, okay, well, I didn't gossip. No, you did. Because that person didn't know any. If that person wanted prayer, that, they could have came up, right? If you know about something and you really do want to pray, then pray about it. But you don't have to disclose the information about somebody. But you see how sneaky we are. We're, we're, we're that way. And that's what Satan wants. Satan wants you to do. God wants you to resist the temptation. Anything that's of this world, anything that's not of God, Satan will try to use it to glorify himself through you. The, the nice thing about it is, look at what it says here. If you submit yourself to God, verse 7, and resist the devil, he, the devil, will flee from you. So if you will take a stand against the devil... The devil will flee. In that that word there, the devil will flee from you, it means to flee as as in terror. To flee from you as in terror. Now last week we also talked about the armor of God. And in Ephesians talks about the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit. You even have gospel shoes. 
and uh, uh, you have a, a loincloth, a, a belt of truth. So when the devil sees you coming, when you're resisting him, all he sees is you're wearing God's armor. Don't lift up the face, you know, plate, and, and show him that it's you. Keep it closed because you're wearing the armor of God. He don't know whether it's God or you. But it does say that you win if you will resist the devil. Because, and now why do you win? Well, the verse before that, verse 7 says, He giveth more grace. You're going to win because you've humbled yourself, you've submitted to God, uh, and He gives you the grace, and now you resist the devil. You're able to resist him, and He will flee from you in terror. Verse 8 continues the thought, Draw nigh to God, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, let's go, let's jump back a couple pages here to James chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 5, I'm going to read from 5 to 8, and then we'll go back to James chapter 4. So James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Wow, who doesn't receive from the Lord? A man who doesn't ask in faith. If you're praying but you're not you're not believing, you might as well not even pray. Or maybe you should be praying that God will help you to believe. So you can believe. But this says if you don't if you if you can't believe the promise, then then uh, uh, he says that you're wavering back and forth. Like the wind being tossed back and forth. He said, Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Double mind. Double mind is kind of like you can, you can think the imagery of a person with two heads. Two heads don't work. If you had two heads on your body, you'd be like, you know, you get up in the morning and say, well, should I go to work today? And the other head would say, no, stay home. Where did I put my car keys? I don't know. You know, you got these two thoughts going on. Uh, it's not going to work. Double mind is, my double mind man is unstable in all his ways. Uh, it'd be like somebody sitting there with a remote control on the TV and keep changing the channels and never watching anything, right? And the reason I brought that up with the double minded, let's go back to James 4 here. You see, we had that right here, double minded. So it really, ref, it, it actually uh, refers back to that. <clears throat> So verse 8, chapter 4, verse 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded, or you two-headed person. Or we, we have an expression, we say two-faced, right? And really, most of us, think about your Christian, the Christian experience most people have. God is holy, God is the creator of the universe. And we say we love God. And yet we do things that he hates. That's kind of being two-faced, isn't it? Or we go back to the, the gossiping and talking about people. Did you realize that those people you're talking about are God's children? How would you like it if, if you had a child and someone was talking about your child? You wouldn't like that very much. I'll tell you, that's the one that's one thing that people will fight over. And that's what should dawn on our heads when when we get to thinking that um, you know we, we it's okay to talk about somebody. God will forgive, but that's not that's not really the, the Christian walk. That's <clears throat> And the, the longer you, you keep, it's like you keep digging a rut when you're living like that. 
And when you when you dig when you dig in the rut, it's going to get deeper and deeper and deeper, and eventually you won't be able to get out of it if it goes on too long. So verse uh, nine: Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Now, what he's referring here: Be afflicted, mourn, and weep. And then he contrasts that with, uh, with laughter. He says, let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. I think what he's saying is when it comes to things that are uh, obviously against God and against the truth, against the walk of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit inside you, we have this tendency to joke about it. We like slap somebody on the, on the shoulder and say, Ah, well, we all sin, right? And the fact is, we do all sin. But when we do stuff, we shouldn't we shouldn't think it's funny, because it's not funny. It, this stuff is serious, and the more we kind of push it off as it's not so serious, again, we're digging ourselves in that rut. So he, what he says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. He's just showing you that these things are some serious things. I, and we began this study with James. We said James is, is really, he just shoots at the, the target continually. This doesn't mean you, you, know, you get all upset and, and you quit going to church because you think you can't, you can't do it. Because the key there is in verse 6, but he giveth more grace, Right? If you'll admit your situation to him and you'll ask for help, he will help you. Verse 10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. In fact, we have a song, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Higher and higher. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother... Now, this is something we we just got through talking about, right? He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. If you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. That's kind of interesting. Let me read that again. Speak not evil of one another, brethren, because he that speaks evil of his brother is judging his brother. Whenever you speak evil of someone, you are judging that whatever they're, you're speaking evil of because you don't agree with what they're doing. And you're passing judgment. And it's not really our place to judge our brother. Because are we the judge? We're not the judge. Who's the judge? There's only one judge. But if you, if you take it, if you start talking about this individual saying, you know what she did, that, 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 now you're judging that, that person's sin. Sure, they're sinning, but it's not your place to be the judge. God is the judge, and he will judge. You don't have to tell God. Verse 11. Speak not evil of one another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judges another? In other words, just reminding you, you're not the judge. You're not the lawgiver. Let God be God. You you be you. And when someone's going through stuff, Allow them to have the same grace that you would want in the situation. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judges another? Verse 13. Go to now, or come come here now, or come, come now. Uh, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Now, so this is a new concept. He left that old concept. Now he's, now he's got a, good, a new one. He's saying, <clears throat> um, we always do a lot of planning. As, uh, as human beings, right? We, we say we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to do this. And what this is saying is um, don't 
Don't say tomorrow we're going to go to this city and we're going to continue there for a year and then we're going to buy and we're going to sell and we're going to get gain. Because he says you do not, verse 14, you do not know what you'll be on the morrow. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, there's a lot of people years ago when they said, oh, the economy is so good and I'm going to take my money and I'm going to put it into these stocks and I'm just going to double my money, look at the way it's going up, 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 and boom, they lose it. Because you don't know. Everything seems like it's going good now for the economy, but you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And so you need, you need to uh, not be so... So cocky, if you will, not so uh, prideful. And just realize that God's the one who's in control. If you want wisdom, again, we, <clears throat> we have in uh, chapter 1 of this, of this book, he says, if anyone at, it lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who, who will give to everyone, right? That asks. So that's where you want to go for your information. So whereas you know... You not, you, uh, verse 14, you know not what shall be in the morrow, for what is your life? So now he gives you something else to consider. What is your life? He said it's like a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You're like a puff of smoke. Just, whew, and you're gone. Like a firecracker. Boom. That's it. Your, your life's over, right? How long does a how how long does a fly live? Just a couple days, I think. Well, think about if you were a if you were a fly. Compare your life to a fly. They only live a couple days. Like a couple days, maybe twenty four hours, like she said. I don't know. If you leave them in a the jar, they'll die. The comparison is, as far as God's concerned, God is eternal. God's going to be here. He's the same yesterday, today, forever, right? But you, your life is like the fly. You're here for just a small amount of time, and then, puff, you're gone. Poof. I should say poof instead of puff. It's like, and then your spirit's release, and you you go to heaven, or you know, hopefully you don't go to the other place. <laughs> but um, so he's saying that don't don't say you're going to do this and you're going to do that and you're going to do this. Take each. I think what he's saying is take each day as a new day. Make the best of that day. He's telling you how your life is like a vapor. You only have a little time. Well, if you're going to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish, when are you going to start? You know, sometimes we, we know God wants us to do something, but we're waiting. Are we, what are we waiting for? For God to give us a phone call? I've noticed, you know, when I was younger... I thought, you know, I've almost felt like I was immortal. When you get older and you start getting the aches and the pains and the, you know, the things going wrong and you've had these things happen, you realize that your life is, you know, you, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So if you're going to do something, you need to get started, right? So then he says, you ought to say... When you're talking about planning, he's now he's not saying don't plan, okay? Like, uh, there's nothing wrong with if you if a, if a, if a young couple is going to have a baby, what do they do? Especially if they know the sex of the baby today. Today they know, right? They'll go out. They'll fix up the bedroom. They'll they'll buy and you know maybe. Uh, crib and you know all, all the things that the baby needs maybe new drapes and maybe, maybe even put wallpaper up if that's you know what you want to do but uh, prepare and get ready that's you know and that's planning nine months down the road that's okay because all things being equal in nine months that baby's coming right you could be planning you know maybe things don't look so good at your job and so you're you're thinking okay well i should be preparing my resume i should be um you know uh, exercising my skills and i'm prepared there's nothing wrong with that but you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow you could be the one that doesn't lose your job they could lay off 350 people but it doesn't touch you in fact my my wife was um uh 
when she worked at Motorola, they had like four, wasn't it four layoffs, seven layoffs, and she never got laid off until the last time. So, but you don't know. You don't know. And he said, so, so you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Always leave it God's will. When you're praying about stuff, you should always add in that prayer whatever your will is, Lord. Because you may be asking for things that you probably shouldn't have. So you want the will of God, right? How many people have gotten destroyed because they, they wanted to be rich, they wanted to be rich, so they, got a, they won the lottery, and then they ruined their life? And then when, and, and some die, and then when you look at them, of course, if they're dead, you don't look at them because they're gone. But you look at the mess that they got themselves in, and you know what? They don't have any money either. Most people are bankrupt that win the lottery. Isn't that something? They win the lottery, get all that money. And they ruin their lives. They ruin their money. So they ruin relationships. Just That's right. Man, man, man. So you know, maybe you weren't supposed to be wealthy like that. Maybe you're not supposed to be the one that wins the lottery. <laughs> and maybe you are. You know, maybe maybe you are. Maybe you are going to win the lottery. I don't know. <clears throat> But now you rejoice, verse 16, you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, I was taught when I was a child, but first, first I was taught that there were the Ten Commandments. If you committed one of those commandments, then that was sin. Right? And then when I got familiar with the Bible, I found out that Moses not only brought those Ten Commandments, he gave 613 laws, which kind of define sin. But when Jesus came, we, we're living under a new dispensation of time. We're living in, under the dispensation of grace. And sometimes we, we wrestle like, well, what is sin and what is not sin? Because we don't know. For instance, some, some people believe you can't eat pork. But they're still Christians. And other Christians say, I can eat anything I want. Because I'm free. So there's a lot of issues like that we have like that. But here's, here's the thing. Verse 17 says, To him that knows to do good. When you know something is either good or bad... If you know it's good and you don't do what's good, to him that is your that's your sin. So when you know what you're supposed to do, what God would have you to do, and you don't do it, that's sin. That might as well be one of the ten. Is running a stop sign a sin? It actually is. You're right. Because the Bible tells us we're supposed to obey the laws, right? So <laughs> speeding, well, speeding. But have I have I gotten a tickets for speeding? Yes. Have I ran a stop sign? Yes. Do I do it on purpose? Do I see a stop sign and so I accelerate and go? You know, no, I'm not. I'm, I didn't do it on purpose, but I, I ran a stop sign. It's kind of like we all sin, right? We we're, we're all sinners. We talked about how um, some people do things in the church to get attention. They don't do it to serve the Lord. If, if you're, whatever, when you're doing something, you're serving, you're actually serving the Lord, that's between you and God. But when you are doing something to say, hey, look what I can do. Look how wonderful I am. Look how God has given me so many talents. God's given every one of us so many talents. A lot of us don't know how to use it or we don't have the confidence or we don't have the opportunity. If you're a leader in the church, you should not be trying to make everybody think you're special. You should be making opportunities for other people to, you know, to, to, to step into that.